get it, let's 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 go. It is now another episode, another another moment to tap in, tap in right now. You're listening to Civics for the Culture, hosted by me, Benny, aka Poetically, P O E T I C L E E Williams. And this is on Lotus X Network. And look here, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a politician, however. I'm someone just like you that has access to information and that has access to learn about how this history of this government, learn how this history of this system, learn how this history of legalities has kind of been set up on, um, you know, to hinder us a a little bit, you know, you know, and that's just that's ultimately what we're going to do here is taking time to really go back into our history, taking time to really go back into our uh our constitution, take time to go back into our leaders, take time to go back into our organizations, our movements, our acts, our different legislations that have been passed and kind of understanding really the underlining tones, the underlining messages, the underlining symbolism that was sent to our people of color, that was sent to oh, people of less color, white people, uh, whoever it may be that, that may not be of strong melanated uh, descent, right? And the reason I'm saying it like that is because there is there is this sense that some people can uh, get away with things that others can't, you know, and, and even in our own culture of people of color where we, we look, let me stop right there. Look, because I'm about to go on a whole nother. This is how we do here. Right. <laughs> we go down rabbit holes sometimes, but we got to control the rabbit hole. We can't, don't want to get too lost. But um, t- what we do here is to break down and understand how this how the system has kind of hindered us not kind of but it has hindered we talked about how slave patrols were the birth of police we talked about how um oh man jim crow era i'm gonna always talk about jim mention jim crow and talk about jim crow because the effects of jim crow and the etiquette and the mindset that was created by those laws are still exist today and has has impacted the black community so much <clears throat> when i talk about even on the sense of how white men and black men are to, were to communicate in that time period, right? And that still kind of lingers on. I talk about how it affected my impacted my life and affected me and my communication. And I knew early on something isn't right here. But it's these it's these it's these standards, quote unquote, that we that we follow. It's this it's this system that we just flow into that without really understanding where it comes from and why we're why we're participating in it. Why are we following just these methods that just go along? Why? Why? Why did this act here? We're going to talk today about the Fair Housing Act. Right. The Fair Housing Act of 1968. Why did they even have to be a fair housing? Why? Why can't you just live where you want to live? Right. Why can't you just live peacefully in the community that you want to live in? Why can't you get uh, funds distributed to the community just as the same as others? To, you know, we're going to talk about that. Why? Why is it? Why am I being uh, blackballed or why am I being outlined or why am I being, quote unquote, or as it's here stated, redlined from certain areas to live in based on who I am? Why? You know, that that goes down another line that goes down another tunnel of questions and answers. So uh, we previously have talked about uh, how we've had to travel through this country, you know, uh, and how we had to use the um, the green book. If you haven't heard that episode, listen back to hear how we had to use the green book to travel safely throughout this country, which then turned into the nation. We've also talked about the uh, the uh, Civil Rights Act and how we had to be accepted into certain places, you know, in uh, ending of Jim Crow era so that we could enjoy freely just living. <laughs> that's 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 the main goal here is to enjoy freely of living and truly feeling comfortable and not feeling embarrassed to be who we are. You know, not feeling ashamed to be who we are, not feeling threatened to be who we are. I shouldn't have to. Why do you feel intimidated? Hmm? You know, what's really going on there? And that's what that's what we're going to get. That's what we're going to get down to. And that's what we're going to talk about. So with the Fair Housing Act of 1968, a brief little uh, summary of what it is before I go into all the details. And I'm reading this as we read as we do each and every episode, read different articles that we that we research and find because that's that, you know, they always say the the (laughs) the they hide, you know, they want to hide information, put it in the books. Right. 
Well, now, fortunately, we have the internet to our to our use, and it was still important to go after these books to really understand what's going on in books because the internet can get that can get a little wishy washy too. However, it's important that we read. So when I read things, I want you to definitely at the same time cross check. I want you want you at the same time to go after your own due diligence because that's what we should be doing here. I should be sparking something to you, and you should be sparking something to me. All right, let's get it. So the Fair Housing Act of 1968 prohibited discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, religion, national origin, or sex. Intended as a follow-up to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the bill was, was the subject of a continuous debate in the Senate, but was passed quickly by the House representatives in the days after the assassination of civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., the Fair Housing Act stands for the stands as the final great legislative achievement of the civil rights era. However, that still we still go through that even in this moment of today. And I'm going to talk about how technology is kind of using some of its discrimination um, practices to use. But we'll get to that soon. So uh, when we talk about the struggle for fair housing, it, uh, despite Supreme Court decisions such as Shelley v. Kramer, uh, 1948 and Jones v. Mayor uh, County in 1968, which outlawed the exclusion of blacks or other minorities from certain sections of cities, race based housing patterns were still enforced by the late 1960s. Those who challenged them often met with resistance, hostility and even violence. Of course, we've talked about that plenty of times here, how people mm, when you just when you when they can't have their way. Even when the law steps in, they still have to come out here and use force, right? We just want to live our lives comfortably. Meanwhile, while a growing number of Blacks and Hispanic members of the armed forces fought and died in the Vietnam War, on the home front, their families had trouble renting or purchasing homes in certain residential areas because of their race or national origin. Here I am putting my life on the line, and you're blocking my family just to live, just to live comfortably. Just to live because they're already going through the anxiety. They're already going through the stress, the depression of me being out here in war where I may not come back. A lot of these brothers and sisters did not come back. A lot of these brothers did not come back. So here you hear my family is going through the stress and anxiety that here a man. Once again, we talk about the black man. So as we go through the understanding, we're going to different point out different points of how, once again, the black man has been uh, taken out of the family and how the, the, the woman has to have take over. But then the stress and the depression of the black man not being there, what that image looks like. Right. So here goes some little nuggets there to that to kind of start that journey of learning. In this climate, organizations such as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, the GI Forum, and the National Committee Against Discrimination in Housing lobbied for new fair housing legislation to be passed. The proposed civil rights legislation of 1968 expanded on and was intended as a follow-up to the historic Civil Rights Act of 1964. The bill's original goal was to, ex to extend federal protection to civil rights workers, but it was eventually expanded to address racial discrimination in housing. The title, title VIII of the proposed Civil Rights Act was known as the Fair Housing Act, a term often used as a shorthand description for the entire bill. It prohibited discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, religion, national origin, and sex. So even through that period, the, there was a con congressional debate, right? So in the U.S. Senate, debate over the proposed legislation, Senator Edward Brooke of Massachusetts, the first black ever to be elected to the Senate by popular vote, spoke personally of his return from World War II, putting his life on the line and his inability to provide a home of his choice, of his choice. Because if I'm putting my life, I'm, no, let's check this out. I've been voted to Senate by popular vote, and now I've, and I've also returned from World War II, right? Yes. Uh, now, I have an inability to provide a home of my choice to my family because of my race. So in, the early, eight, in early April of 1968, the bill passed the Senate. And the bill passed the Senate, albeit by an exceedingly slim margin, thanks to the support of the Senate Republican leader, Everett Dirksen, which defeated a Southern filibuster. Interesting. 
It then went to the House of Representatives from which it was expected to emerge significantly weakened. The House had grown increasingly conservative as a result of urban unrest and the increasing strength and militancy of the Black Power Movement. And also, quick break into talking about movements. We talk about Black Power Movements, which were on another Black Power Movement, Black Lives Matter. Please go back and listen to our episode where we talked about the MOVE organization and their impact in Philadelphia. All right. So on April 4th, the day of the Senate vote, the civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr., was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Timing. Hmm. Where he had gone to aid striking sanitation workers amid a wave of emotion, including riots, burning and looting in more than 100 cities around the country. President Lyndon B. Johnson increased pressure on Congress to pass the new civil rights legislation. Since the summer of 1966, when King had participated in marches in Chicago, calling for open housing in that city, he had been associated with the fight for fair housing. Johnson argued that the bill would be a fitting testament to the man and his legacy, and he wanted it passed prior to King's funeral in Atlanta. After a strictly limited debate, the House passed the Fair Housing Act on April 10th, and President Johnson signed it into law the following day. So when we talk about the impact of the Fair Housing Act, you know, uh, despite the historic nature of the Fair Housing Act, its stature and as the last major act of legislation of, uh, of legislation of the civil rights movement and practice, housing remained segregated in many areas of the United States in years that follow. And we're going to talk about that, even how technology is still influencing that. Uh, from 1950 to 1980, the total black population in America's urban centers increased from 6.1 million to 15.3 million. During the same time period, white Americans steadily moved out of the cities into the suburbs, taking many of the employment opportunities blacks needed into communities where they were not welcome to live. Right. Right. This trend, uh, this trend led to the growth of urban America, of ghettos or inner city communities with high minority uh, populations that were played by unemployment. I'm going to say, quote unquote, crime and other social ills, because go back and listen to our broken windows episode, broken windows theory. This is all important. How see all, all the puzzles are coming together now, because when we talk about crime, we're talking about just because the broken windows theory, which which uh, was a theory used by police, that if an area is, is um has broken windows, abandoned buildings, abandoned cars, that crime must exist, right? Right. But then you can go overseas and didn't see these different uh, uh, very um, uh, abandoned or maybe maybe just uh, not aesthetically appeasing, appeasing towns and villages and cities. But crime doesn't exist there. So obviously the, the, the being poor and being uh, and being unemployed doesn't start crime, but it's what the mindset starts is what you infiltrate in that community starts. Right. All right. We're going somewhere. <laughs> In 1988, Congress passed the Fair Housing Amendment Act, Amendments Act, which expanded the law to prohibit discrimination in housing based on disability or family status, a pregnant woman or the presence of a child under 18. These amendments brought the enforcement of the Fair Housing Act even more squarely under the control of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is HUD, which that's why it's important who we vote, because who we vote appoints these people to direct these direct these positions and then if you don't have someone that's ever done it before check who's there now i'm just gonna say check who's there now and if you don't have anyone that's ever done that before specifically or even shown uh history or actions then how can we truly trust that our areas are, that are supposed to be in development are being developed I hope you're following, <laughs> which sends uh complaints regarding housing discrimination to be investigated by its office of fair housing an equal opportunity, which is the F H E O. And as we talk about the Fair Housing Act, I want to also get into the red line, right? Because since the Fair Federal Housing Administration was established in 1934, housing segregation has been entrenched in the fiber of the American landscape. That's no, that is, that is even, it's not even uh, opinion, that is fact. 
by refusing to insure mortgages and in, in, uh, mortgages in near uh, black community, black neighborhoods. The Federal Housing Administration encouraged segregation, forcing minorities to remain in urban centers while whites moved to overexpanding suburbs. So, you know, once you start to re refuse mortgages to these areas, where do we have to go live? Right. Right. This tactic has since been known as become as redlining, which is defined as the systematic denial of various services to residents of specific, often racially associated neighborhoods, uh, racially associated neighborhoods or communities, either directly or through the selective raising of prices. Mm. Although this explicit form of redlining was declared illegal 50 years ago. Eh, eh. Yeah, they did. They're going to declare, but it still goes on. Uh, although it was declared illegal over 50 years ago in 1968 with the passage of the Fair Housing Act, it continues to do harm today. The echoes of this policy still impact our cityscapes with educational funding. Now we're going somewhere with educational funding tied to property taxes and in extension, the value of the housing in the neighborhood. Redlining still contributes to the systematic denial of resources to poor and minority neighborhoods. Technology provides families with an abundance of tools and options which allow them to find the perfect neighborhood to move their families into. You know, when you're looking, when you get ready to move, you're looking, okay, let me see, what's the score of this, right? Whatever website you may be on, you're always looking at the score and you're always looking at the school. Hmm. What does that tell you though? Who's controlling that really? Hmm. Many families heavily consider an area based on school desirability. Websites like Great Schools allow these families to effortlessly, and there's plenty of websites too, uh, effortlessly evaluate schools based on quality test scores and environment. According to Great Schools, their rating follows a one to 10 scale where 10 is the highest and one is the lowest. Each rating is assigned a color along, along with uh, along a gradient, dark green is a 10, yellow is five, orange is a one. With parents becoming more tech savvy, it is simple for a parent to choose the school with the most fits their desires and budget. Why choose to have your children attend a school rated a two when you can move them into a similar district with a school rated into an eight? Right. Right. And that is what we talk about. You know, when we talk when we talk about property taxes, because that now we're getting somewhere and why it's important too, also to fill out your census. Property taxes are used as a modern day barriers to prevent all students from succeeding in the public school system. When students receive their educational funding through these means, it reinforces their social standing. There is no freedom in moving to a better school district as most families are locked into the neighborhoods they can afford. With access to education locked and based on socioeconomic status, the educational prospects and ability to alter their status is significantly hindered. Come on now. Where are we really going? I hope you follow me now. This self perpetrating cycle harms every student's ability to succeed by cracking open these norms and providing low income students with quality education. It is possible to begin to overcome these inequalities and begin to undo the decades of redlining entrenched in our educational system because redlining housing act they, and education all mix in together because now I can not only tell you where to live, I can tell you how to do it education is divvied out and how the education is gained, how the education is funded where you live as well. So not only where we live is hindered because of the, the, maybe the air quality, maybe the companies that are moving in as far as the, the, uh, the, the manufacturing, the production companies that are moving in and they're putting toxins into the air. But now you have uh, your roles are not getting funded properly. Now your school system isn't getting funded properly. Now it's just becoming when you when you're not prop when you're not properly managing something. What, what are we doing mentally? See, this is all a cycle right here. And this is why we do this right here. This is why we talk about these different things, because we wonder how we get into these cycles. We wonder why is somebody acting this way? Right. Well, it comes from a place. It comes from it comes from the programming. It comes from what you see and, and then processing into your brain and make you think who you are, make you think what you can't succeed. Now you wonder why people are always why are you going to live in the white neighborhood? Because it, it comes in from this inside urge and fight to just want to get out. That's what you hear growing up. I just want to get out. But we got to start to build back and build up. Cause ain't no getting out. So we're here, baby. We're here. And this is what we're gonna do. You're now listening to Civics for the Culture, hosted by me, Benny, aka Poetic Lee, P-O-E-T-I-C-L-E-E, -E -E, Williams on Lotus X Network.
content that's just going to rebirth your purpose of living. Because I hope when you hear stuff, like when you hear information like this, it should provide you some some kind of thinking to, okay, how can I, how can my neighborhood be better? Now, how can I just leave the neighborhood? But how can my community be better? So my brother and my sisters, it doesn't have to be blood brothers, you know, blood, blood sisters. But how can my brothers and sisters out here successfully rise above the hindrance that's happened and because of our neighborhood not being the quality because our school system then our school systems aren't the quality then our jobs aren't the quality now our livelihood isn't the quality now we're going to change all that we're going to change all that and it starts with learning first so thank you thank you please share with someone else and please follow poetic lee on instagram follow uh watch lotus x cross the social medias and we'll stay tuned and remember rise up and wise up